Welcome to The Great Awakening. I'm your host, Josh Dawes. My guest today is Dusty Devers. He is a pastor in Oklahoma who has recently announced that he is running for state senate in the state of Oklahoma. And I wanted to have Dusty on to talk about why he felt like God was calling him to do this and uh, more generally about um, you know, the need for Christians to be more involved in the political process and maybe even run for office. So it's a really uh, refreshing conversation. You talk to you know, a lot of politicians and they, uh, they won't go off of their script. They answer the questions they want to answer. Um, but Dusty, um, this is a, just a really refreshing conversation because Dusty will tell you what he thinks. And so we get into um, you know, a lot of his uh, beliefs about government and uh, the Christian's role in government. Um, Dusty is also known uh, for being really active uh, abortion abolitionist. So we talk about that and what that means, how that's different than um, the pro-life movement that you may be um, familiar with. Um, and so it's, um, it was a, a really interesting conversation. I think you're really going to enjoy it. So let's jump right into my conversation with Dusty. Hey, Dusty, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. All right, so you are um, running for uh, state senate in Oklahoma. You are a, a pastor. Can you, you know, tell our audience a little bit about who you are and 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 why you uh, why you're running for office there? Yeah, my name is Dusty Devers, and I am one of the elders at Grace Community. Well, it used to be Grace Community Church. We just changed the name to Grace Reformed Baptist Church in Elgin, Oklahoma. It's in Southwest Oklahoma, near Lawton and Fort Sill Army Base. And I've been pastoring here for seven years, a little over, uh, since we started this church. And it was a church plant uh, that merged with a First Baptist Church of Elgin, where I grew up going to church and uh, came back, moved to, back to Elgin in 2013 to manage a pharmacy that my parents started. My dad was a pharmacist. He and uh, he's in a memory care facility now, uh, not doing well at all. And uh, I moved back to, to manage the pharmacy and then plant churches and see what the Lord would do. And, and here we are. Now I'm running for state senate as a pastor. It is a bivocational uh, pastor job. And um, so I, there's a story behind that, and we can maybe get into it. But that's the, that's the short version. I do have six kids. And uh, my oldest is 18 and my youngest is five. And uh, I've been married for coming up on 20 years in October. Nice. So uh, when you announced this, uh, I think it was last week, uh, maybe earlier this week, um, I saw a lot of, uh, you know, kind of responses on Twitter, just horrified that a pastor would be running, uh, running for office. Uh, how, you know. No, separation of church and state. You guys need to stay out of this. Um, you know, even surprisingly coming from, you know, many, uh, many Christians seem to have that attitude of like, well, that's not the pastor's place. That's, that's uh, too close to, uh, you know, merging church and state. Um, what's your response to that? Oh, man. Well, I have several. I think in general, well, the, the response I thought was very positive. There were a few who had questions, and I only saw a couple that said, this can't be. And really, most of those were, uh, I've seen one or two responses from people who are in the very conservative camp, and most of them are in the moderate to left camp, who say that pastors shouldn't be because of separation of church and state. And I would just say, uh, first, God is God of all, and Christ is Lord of all, and the scriptures are sufficient for all. So to separate God from anything, I think, is the height of arrogance and sin. Uh, so I don't want to do that. And I don't think that it's wise to do that. Uh, fools despise wisdom. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So if we're going to start with having knowledge and being wise legislators, we better know the Lord and know his word. And he has been kind enough to uh, reveal himself to us, both in the things that he has created and in his word. And so I think that those who are most suited to uh, wield authority as God commands them to, as his servants, are those who 
would seek to practice justice and establish that justice according to the almighty God and his his designs for his creation. So, you know, I think it is not just appropriate, but it's required for someone who is taking office, who is going to be a civil authority, to do so from a position of humility being mastered by the master of all, and that is Christ and his word. Yeah, well, I, so much of the kind of online debate, um, you know, surrounding Christian nationalism and Christians in, uh, you know, politics and, and what that looks like, it gets stuck in the, the theoretical, you know, a, a far off distant Christian, Christian prince or whatever. Um, but I love that you're, you're actually, you know, doing something. You're not just talking about it online, but you're actually seeing a need in your community and, uh, and stepping up and saying, Hey, I'm, I'll, I'll accept this responsibility. And, uh, uh, why do you think it is that, that more Christians don't, um, run for office? Don't, uh, you know, try to, you know, play a more active role in the political process. Yeah, I think there are several reasons that I can think of just off the top of my head. <clears throat> Number one, I think there, you know, for a long time in the United States, there's been this, thought that if you're a pastor or in a 501c3, you can't say anything about government, you can't say anything about politics, and that's just fundamentally wrong according to uh, the laws of uh, and the policies for 501c3s. But also, it's, it's, it's not appropriate whenever it comes to Scripture. Like I said earlier, uh, Christ is Lord over all, and he speaks to all things in his creation, and he would have his creation ordered according to his word. And so uh, that's that's wrong on its face, I think. Secondly, uh, you know, there has been, I think, a sentiment going since, and it comes from, I think, uh, various theological positions on the end times that says, you know, we are going to uh, just worry about us and our friends and maybe our church, particularly in my own life. And we we basically uh, aren't going to be into a position of success here in this world that's going to get worse and worse and worse. So everything's going to collapse. So just do with you what you can uh, as close to you so that whenever it does collapse, you're safe. And I think it is, um, I think it, it's, it's uh, reductionistic at least uh, to read the scriptures in that way. And then to make the application that you, uh, that Christ's word essentially and being zealous for good works really applies personally and in the home and to the church, but not as much to the civil sphere. Uh, so there's, I think that's one of the reasons I, I won't get into too much uh, theological jargon, uh, but I think people who are listening know what we're talking about. I mean, there have been interviews even recently from pastors who have said, look, the church really doesn't have anything to do with speaking to the civil sphere or even more so participating in civil authority. Uh, so I, don't, I just I think that's a couple of the reasons. Um, and let me give you one more. I think there are, you know, pol politics and. I think we need to understand the difference between politics and and wielding civil authority. In the scriptures, you see over and over that, like in Romans 13, that civil authorities are God's servants. They have been appointed by him, and so he has properly bestowed upon them a measure of authority to be wielded in the proper context. And that context for authority is to protect and avenge the innocent. That's the first thing. Second, to praise the good. And third, to be a terror to evildoers. Uh, by what standard? Well, by the standard of God's moral law. Some people call it the natural law. Natural law, And it's essentially uh, the, the law that's written on the heart, the, uh, which is summarily comprehended or summed up in the Ten Commandments. So we see that God gives authority to civil, in the civil sphere, and he appoints these men as his servants. Now, 
politics, the difference between that and politics, at least in common parlance, has become, well, politics is something nasty and grimy and dirty that, that only schemers and scoundrels do. And while that's probably a lot true, um, I, I think a lot of people, good men who have been in the church, say, I don't want to do that. And they think that that's what it means to be in the civil sphere. And that's just, you shouldn't do that. If there's, if, if a man goes into the civil sphere, into uh, using the authority that God has commanded men to use on this earth to establish justice uh, by law and protect the innocent, then they should never be swindlers and scoundrels and practice all this nasty pragmatism. So whenever you separate those two and you start to think appropriately biblically, you see the use of authority is God appointed on men to establish justice, to practice righteousness uh, in the civil sphere. Now that by practice righteousness, I just mean what is just and good in a society, according to God's word. If they start to think of governing in that sense, then I think there will be more men who say, oh, I can do that. I know what, because I do that mm -hmm. in my home. I, I try to practice a just government in my home. So I just need to translate that into the civil sphere, into a broader context. And that's why the home is the building block for a good government. And whenever that home, the good government in the home spills out all across our nation, we're going to have that. And I would say, I know I'm kind of ranting here, but can I just say one more thing uh, that I think is important? And, and that would be sure. when, whenever politics, it has become nasty, nasty, nasty. And men who are good and capable at reading the scriptures and, and discipling and training their homes to have to be well ordered and then they train their businesses to be well ordered or even their churches they look at what happens to a lot of these men who run for office and they do not want to be slandered and reviled and just ran through the mud and that's an appropriate response i mean who really wants to put themselves in that situation but the reality is it's going to happen and we need men who say look the glory of God is is worth me being slandered and reviled. And I know, as Jesus says, whenever they slander and revile me in his name, I can uh, go off and, and rejoice because I was mm -hmm. counted worthy to suffer or to be treated so in the name of Christ. So they have to be willing to say, my identity is in Christ. It is not in what people say or how people treat me or even my past. My identity is in Christ now, and I am so content in him that I'm willing to take these slings and arrows for the greater good of his glory and the justice of these people. And that's really what it means to love God and love neighbor, I think. Yeah, yeah. It reminds me of the old, um, I think it was uh, Edmund Burke quote, you know, the only thing necessary mm -hmm. for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think um, getting back to what you said about, you know, pastors um, you know, reluctant to talk about it because of, you know, thinking that that's inappropriate as a 501c3. Um, I also think there's, you know, there's a good distinction that a lot of, you know, I think pastors want to hold on to that there are separate civil, you know, separate spheres of authority. You know, you've got your fam the family, you've got the state and you've got the church. And, you know, we, we really want those things to stay separate, but in a self- uh, you, you know, a self-governing society, part of discipling, um, you know, your people uh, and making disciples is teaching them how to, you know, self-govern themselves. And that that re requires us to, um, you know, to participate in the, the political realm. And, and some of us are uh, are more situated, are more you know, the Lord is blessed financially or with, you know, the flexibility to step up uh, and and, you know, receive that that mantle of responsibility or volunteer for that. And I think, uh, you know, it would be a good idea for for pastors to 
you know, as we're talking about, you know, all of the various ways that you can serve your community, you know, through, you know, crisis pregnancy centers or, you know, um, you know, whatever ministries your church is involved with, I, I, it'd be a good idea to start calling up um, people in our churches to, to fulfill that, that type of role in, um, in the political realm as well. Let, let me let me say how this came about for me, and it might be a good story to help some uh, pastors process. So the Oklahoma legislature is a part time job. It's from from February to May, and it starts on Monday at noon and it ends Thursday at noon. I will be able to drive back home every night. I'm about an hour away from the Capitol and spend time with my family and then be able to carry a lot, if not most or all of the load for pastoral ministry. Uh, I am bivocational. So if I am not going to say that every pastor needs to try to run, uh, I don't think that God would put that burden on anyone. I think it's a matter of the conscience and that needs to be trained and, and considered, but also consider uh, whether this position is doable with your work at, at the church but also ask your, your church. So in, in our situation, this position, uh, the Senate seat came open whenever the, the incumbent stepped down and this is a special uh, race. And we have, um, it, it just came up out of nowhere in, in for us. And so we, we prayed and we talked to the church and we, we asked our men, look, uh, somebody from our church needs to run and we all need to be praying about it so we prayed about it for a few weeks and then we had a final prayer meeting and uh, both one of our other elders and then myself put our names forward and uh, we then took a time of prayer and after that time of prayer the church charged me to take up my duty as both a citizen of our nation and as a, a pastor who knows the word and hopefully can apply God's word wisely to just governing. So they charged me to do so. And that's how it happened in our situation. I'm not saying that there's a, there's a formula or a recipe for it, but I think that more men need to recognize this is something that, that is doable for, for some pastors, uh, probably a lot, uh, especially in smaller areas. And that I don't see any any uh, prohibition in Scripture where pastors can't. And now, especially considering the civil the uh, the the spears, uh, and keep you know we, we don't there, it's it's impossible to separate God from government. It's an inescapable reality. You can't take away some authority, some high, highest authority from power there's always going to be a highest authority in power whether you like them or not whether you agree with them or whether you're coming under their great tyranny there's going to be a god of the system and that's an inescapable reality so you, we just need to choose which which one it's going to be is it going to be the god of uh, almighty who has created uh, heavens and earth and everything under it and then led by men who submit to him who are seeking to humble themselves before him or some other system that's going to be, in essence, serpent, a serpentine theocracy. Yeah, yeah. I think if anything, the last several years have has clearly revealed is that the illusion of um, a neutral secular state was just that it was it was a, an illusion. Um, you know, whatever um, you know appeared to be neutral for for so many decades was just running off the vapors of a you know the whatever was left of a, a christian moral foundation and now that that has been kind of completely you know removed from the secular sphere we see this uh you know new religion of you know of wokeness and all the transgenderism and, and all this stuff just swooping in to fill that void and you know we're gonna have to uh christians are gonna have to become comfortable exercising um the the will to govern according to a, a christian moral framework again and uh, i think it's uh, it, it's important for us to 
to be talking about that and to not be afraid. Um, you know, I think natural law arguments are great, but, um, you know, ultimately natural law you know, points back, like you're saying, to the Ten Commandments, to God's law. It, it is where how we see God's law in nature and and that we shouldn't be afraid to uh, to make those sort of arguments um, as free people of a you know country that can, you know, there is no uh, prohibition on Christians bringing their values to the political realm. Uh, we need to do that. Yeah. Um, amen. I mean, our, our constitution, sorry, no, go ahead. I think there's a delay in my, uh, in my mic. So go ahead, go ahead where you're going, Joe. Uh, I was just going to ask you what, um, what your, uh, what your platform is. What are you hoping to accomplish? Should you be elected? What I'm hoping to accomplish is first to submit myself to the scriptures and uh, walk by the spirit and not gratify the desires of the flesh, and then uh, lead from an appropriate application of the scriptures. And whatever may come, uh, we are kind of starting with the platform, and that platform really is about establishing justice in various spheres. Uh, we want to see morality brought back to government. Um, and so, you know, that if you're going to try to bring morality back to government, that, that touches on several areas. And I think you know, you look at the most urgent and and uh, the most urgent dominant evils in the society, and you want to to deal with those, and you want to deal with areas where it's going to build up the family because the family is the building blocks of a of a just society and building up. So, just along those lines, you know, I think when you you think about building up a family, you know, there are certain there are certain base level issues that have to be either either prohibited and and punished for or strengthened. And for instance, parental rights. Parents need to have their own control over their education and health care needs. And they need to not only access what their children are being taught or what is being injected into them, but they need to they need to know, uh, be able to defend and protect their children against all those things and have ultimately have the control over, over those things. If, especially if they're innocent parents, you know, they haven't done anything wicked or wrong towards their children so that the state wouldn't have to come in and take up the responsibility of the parents. And I, I say state, I mean, uh, those who are in governing authority take up the role of parents. I think one of the other things that's been so destructive for families uh, for in the broader sense is pornography. I think we've got rampant pornography in so many, uh, it, it just, it's, it's everywhere. It's accessible. It's uh, one of the kind of the, the precursors, the gateway drug to so much uh, corruption and licentiousness and perversion in the home and in schools and in uh, towards marriage, it it we need to deal with pornography. Um, I think there are a couple of states who have done some of those things. Uh, you know, I want to see people have the right to self defense and defend our Second Amendment rights, uh, and not let those be infringed, as the Constitution says. So there are there's a couple of things, and I think. At the, at the root level, I think one of the great evils that we are facing is that we won't give equal protection to all people from the point of conception or fertilization. And we must do that. And I think we have to criminalize the act of prenatal homicide. Some people call it abortion. We have called it abortion for years. We just haven't treated it as the murder or prenatal homicide that is it, that it is. So we need to give equal protection and criminalize it by abolishing abortion. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's talk about that. You're, um, you know, I'm, some of my listeners may not um, be familiar with the, the differences between uh, someone who would call themselves an, an abortion abolitionist um, and the pro-life movement. Um, you would consider yourself an abolitionist. Uh, what's the difference there and how do you, how do you, um, 
you know, how would you see governing as an abolitionist as opposed to governing as a uh, someone, you know, identifying as, as part of the pro-life movement? Yeah. Well, the since since Roe versus Wade was passed in 1973, there it was only up until I think 2019 that we actually had a bill that was run, and it was not run by a pro-lifer, but it was the first bill for to establish equal protection for all lives from conception fertilization to give preborn children the same rights that you and I have as born people. So what the pro-life movement really is the, the distinction is that abolitionists want to criminalize as the as the goal of of giving equal protection. They want to criminalize the act of prenatal homicide. And the pro-life uh, establishment, some of them, I think it's very, very few, are now starting to talk about equal protection. But by equal protection, if they do not mean criminalizing the act of prenatal homicide from conception fertilization, then it's just not equal protection. There's a big difference between pro-life and abolition. I can give you a few very specific distinctions now. Uh, the pro-life um, position is probably best taken up from the letter that the National Right to Life wrote um, during, what was it, two years ago, I think, whenever there was a bill of abolition being passed in, or being argued from the floor in Louisiana. And they took up a position that we have been saying they held for years, and they finally uh, admitted to it. And that was that all women are the second victim of abortion. So they're, it's called the second victim narrative or the second victim doctrine, that the baby is a victim and the mother is a victim of society or others who are telling her that it's not a child or it's not murder or that she deserves a better life or whatever. And so they see a second victim narrative and she is always a victim who is pressured or coerced in various ways, even though, you know, some can see that there that a woman could be morally culpable, that she should never be held legally culpable or accountable. Um, and then the second thing is that they will not pursue to pass and they will actually fight against any legislation that would criminalize the act of prenatal homicide. That is their, their two biggest platforms. Yeah. That, that to me, that, um, that whole idea of the, the woman being the second victim, um, it might've made sense. You know, I, I, I probably, you know, said that myself, you know, 20 years ago. Um, but with with social media and seeing so many of the shout your abortion stories and it, it, just how much it's celebrated, it's it's considered like a rite of passage um, and without any any, you know, um, remorse or any sort of, um, you know, misunderstanding about what they're doing. Um, I, I just can't. I can't understand how people can still kind of hold on to that. Um, yeah, so that that one that was kind of surprising to me after after Dobbs uh, overturned Roe v. Wade, just to see um, pro lifers. I, I guess I just never seen um, you know put two and two together, but just to see them come out against you know any sort of equal equal protection. Um, was was super uh, eye opening to me. Um, just part in particular, just um, you know, I, 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 growing up, I always you know heard of abortion's murder, and it's like okay, yeah. So obviously, we're all trying to, you know, the end goal of everything is to have equal protection for the for the unborn and to treat that like you know we would a murder of a, a, a three month old baby, and uh, and you know I I still remember. You know, I think it was with that Louisiana bill, just seeing the the just the concerted effort to defeat that. 
was just like, wait a minute, what, what have we been fighting for this whole time? If not that, and I think that's when I started to kind of really consider the, the difference between the abolitionist movement and the pro-life movement. And you know, a lot of the abolitionist movement, abolitionist arguments make a ton of sense to me, um, especially in a post row world. Um, the one area where I am still not quite there, and maybe you can kind of talk me over the line here. Um, abolitionists are against any form of incremental legislation. Uh, so you would, um, you know, I don't want to say what you would be for, but abolitionists have, you know, you know traditionally been against uh, like heartbeat bills or, uh, you know, a 20 week abortion ban. Um, isn't, Aren't those good, though? Aren't they limiting abortions? And shouldn't we celebrate any, you know, baby steps toward that ultimate goal of equal protection? You know, theoretically, I think, I think people like those because they, they think it's saving lives. And the reality is those, those aren't saving lives. They're just training a culture because law is pedagogical. Law is a tutor. It's training the culture to make impulse buys on their prenatal homicides to kill their children earlier before they've had time to talk to family members or talk to their pastor or talk to folks who say, no, this is a, this is a life and your life is not going to be ruined by having a child. And if, if they get linked up with someone who says, you know what? Motherhood is always a blessing. Children are never a curse. They're always a reward from God. You can do this. We're going to help you do this. So uh, the reality is they're not saving babies, number one. And the greater issue is, though, it's not that it's not saving babies. The greater issue is that what does God say? God demands that we show no partiality and justice, that we establish righteous judgment. And you see this throughout, throughout the Old Testament, but you see it through the New Testament as well. So we must give to, the, to, to give to establish justice would be to give equal protection, demand the same treatments and protections under law that you and I as born people enjoy be extended to all lives from fertilization conception. God hates partiality and judgment throughout the scriptures. We see that this is an abomination. People are judged strictly and swiftly for showing partiality. Jesus warns against it. To the Pharisees, he calls them hypocrites and broods of vipers. James, the half-brother of Jesus, says you must not show partiality, which God hates. God hates. So that's the bigger issue. We are compromising uh, on God's standard of holy justice. And we are usurping God's sovereignty as creator and the crown rights of Christ to say how he wants his people to be treated. I mean, it's the uh, sixth commandment. You shall not murder. And Jesus, Jesus picks that up and says, uh, to apply the sixth commandment is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, so whatever you wish others would do to you, do it to them. That's the law and the prophets, Jesus says in Matthew 12. So we could talk more about incrementalism and change by degree and, and what it does. You know, I think it delays uh, the what is just, and it puts off doing the single thing that God has commanded that we do to establish righteous judgment. Uh, it, it trains a society to be more callous towards uh, God and towards sin, and it it rejects the 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 beauty and the perfection of God's holiness by by uh marring him because all all law is built on the righteous character of god so then there's just so many problems with it it's not that we don't have uh, a command on what to do we have that uh, to cease doing evil we it's not that it's that we we don't have the will like you said earlier to establish god's law in how we treat people and especially the preborn. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, 
So your second argument there, I think, is a great argument for um, is a great argument for why we need equal protection. Um, I think your first argument is more persuasive to me on incrementalism. I think that's a great point that the law, you know, is a, is a teacher, it's training. And I hadn't considered that, that, you know, you're, you're really pushing women to make an impulse um, abortion uh, without, you know, whereas if there was more time, maybe they would, you know, take that more seriously uh, instead of rushing out to get it to beat the, the clock. I think that's very persuasive. Um, Politics has been called the art of the compromise. Uh, I think where I disagree with the incremental approach is this kind of mind reading, um, you know, that the pro-life movement tries to do of like, well, the people aren't ready for that. So we have to offer this, um, you know, to, so we can make some progress uh, because people aren't ready f- for that. And, in, and kind of disguising, um, you know, what maybe our ultimate uh, goals are. And um, and and trying to um, I don't know this it's it's just this really pragmatic way of kind of trying to appeal to voters that I find really uh, distasteful and it's it, it's kind of like a I feel like it's 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 got a lot of hubris in it that that we know what you know the voters can handle and what they want and uh, instead of actually going in and trying to clearly say this is what our goals are. This is what we want to accomplish. And then, uh, you know, going through the political process, if you have to make compromises to get something passed, then that seems more reasonable to me. Like if if the compromise is the result of trying to get everything we want, then, OK, it, it's politics. A certain degree of that is going to happen. But when we set out, you know, you know, with the compromise as the goal, it just seems like we're, you know, completely gutless uh movement um is 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 how would you handle that in you know uh say you're elected and you know some legislation comes and you're in there fighting for you know equal protection would you be willing to make any compromises if that's what it took in order to um to get the legislation passed romans 3 8 and why not do evil that good may come, as some people slanderously charged us with saying, their condemnation is just. I will never, ever vote to compromise on God's righteous standard, because I will not do evil that some good may come at the expense of doing what God demands. If, if, if we are willing to compromise and say, well, you can, when, here's the reality, whenever you write a law that says you can't kill children after six weeks, but you can kill them before six weeks, then by the, they don't say you can kill them before, but by consequence, they're codifying the legal right to murder preborn children up to six weeks. I will never agree with that. I will never sign on and think, well, we got what we could. No, the reason why we couldn't get more is, is there's a lot of reasons that we got to this place, but it is a hardness of heart. It's a callousness of heart towards God and towards our neighbor. It's not loving to God. It's not loving to neighbor. So I will, I will never sign a bill that codifies into law the partiality that God calls an abomination and for which I should be judged if I do such a thing. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, there's a, I, I'm, I'm so encouraged that this is that this conversation is happening now. I, I saw um, one of the abolition. I forget who it was, but um, went on Ali Beth Stuckey's show and um, had a great I mean, she had a lot of the same questions. And I think he did a, a great job of answering that. And I think this is is really good for Christians to be wrestling, um, wrestling with this and, and kind of reprogramming a lot of the. I don't know, thinking about um, politics and, you know, you know, the, the legislation that we've uh, we've historically been been for. Um, and so I appreciate you, you know, you know, kind of talking me through this and helping me understand your perspective a little bit better. 
Well, thank you, Josh. Uh, you know, maybe I could just say a couple of things about what I, I what we see and in, in, I think what just government actually does for people. Because when we when we compromise with evil and say, okay, we'll we'll just take what we can, then we're actually not getting the government and the freedom that that is out there for us because we wouldn't just say not a single hoof like Moses said to Pharaoh, he would not compromise. And we have to take that stance with, with evil. We're not going to compromise on evil because God's glory is worth it. And me obeying him is more important. And I'll, I'll take whatever slings and arrows God providentially brings my way, whether it be through evil or his discipline, whatever. Proverbs 29, 2 says this, when the righteous increase, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. I would consider a compromise bill. If, if, if I wouldn't sign it, I wouldn't put it forth. But I understand that sometimes there are changes by increment. God's standard doesn't change that. And if people are too hardened to change and repent right away, all the way with a happy heart, and then obey what God says with the treatment towards a preborn, then they are going to have to take the judgment for that. I don't, I don't want to participate in that. So Proverbs 29, 2, when the wicked rule, the people groan. Those types of compromise bills are a, are a sliver or a, a, a portion of the wicked ruling, and people are going to groan. And particularly, we've got preborn people groaning under those kinds of laws. Uh, Psalm 94. Here's what what God says about the the wicked uh, proud who are ruling them. It says they crush your people, O Yahweh, and afflict your heritage. They kill the widow and the sojourner and murder the fatherless. And then Psalm ninety four twenty. Can wicked rulers be allied with you? Those who frame injustice by statute. He calls those who would frame injustice by statute. So it's a partiality. We'll, we'll protect these, but not those. Uh, as wicked rulers, I, I don't. I'm not going to to be that before God. It, God help me. Uh, I don't want to be called a wicked ruler because I frame injustice by statute. And He says in verse 21, they band together against the life of the righteous and condemn the innocent to death. That's what's actually happening. With these types of bills, they they band together and make the innocent preborn child or innocent older. This is this applies in numerous ways in our society. They make innocent people their prey by law. They frame it into law, and then they say, "See, it's it's legal for us to be predators and for you to be the prey." by condemning the innocent to death. And I think that's happening. I think that's what's uh, being established. And whenever you talk about the will of Christians to rule according to God's moral character, according to God's moral law, we have to stand up and say, God's judgment is, is on us to whatever degree, and it will be on us even more if we don't obey him and order our world according to his righteous standards. Well, Dusty, I um, I tell you, it's uh, it's refreshing to talk to someone running for office who will tell you exactly what they think. Um, I've interviewed politicians before, and it's it's tough to get uh, get them out of that kind of prepared um, prepared uh, you know talking points uh, script. And uh, it's uh, I appreciate that you are um, you're upfront about what you believe, um, what you hope to accomplish there, and uh, I wish you. Um, you know, the best of luck or, you know, God's providence uh, there. Um, I hope he blesses your, your campaign. And um, how can people uh, support you if they uh, are so inclined? Yeah, thank you for asking, Josh. And I think I appreciate you having me on for your time. And just, you're a very gracious uh, host. And I've always appreciated your podcast, too. Um, you can go to www.devers2023.com and you can find 
my building platform there. Again, I've been a pastor, not been in the political world. So we're, we're talking with folks and we're studying and reading and, and talking with other uh, legislators and we're building out the platform there. You can read more about it there. And if you're so inclined uh, to, to give, make donations, you can make donations there. We, we're, it's going to be a hard race and uh, we are going to need all the help we can get to get our information out there and Lord willing to win October 10th is the vote, the primary vote. So we've got to win that. And then we go to the general and the vote would be December 10th. So any help would be, man, it would be extremely, uh, we would be in such gratitude and debt to you uh, and just thank the Lord for it. Yeah. Well, I hope, uh, I hope this, this podcast uh, sends plenty of people your way. And if you're in, um, Oklahoma, I'm sure you would love volunteers um, to help um, make calls or canvas or, or whatever. So please, uh, yeah, hit up yeah. Um, Dusty's website and um, and chip in how you can. Uh, well, Dusty, it has been great Thank talking you, to you. Um, I hope uh, hope uh, your campaign goes well. That's our show for today. Big thanks to Dusty Devers for joining me for this conversation. Uh, if you would like to support his uh, campaign, there will be a link in the show notes where you can do that. Uh, he's also active on Twitter, so be sure to follow him there. If you enjoyed this conversation, please share it with a friend. If you're watching on YouTube, like and subscribe. Uh, if you're listening, ratings and reviews over at Apple Podcasts are always helpful. Uh, until next time, I will see you soon.